I can't answer the first question on the problem of passing. My recollection is that there were not many Negroes in Washington who attempted to pass even if they could. Some of those who have been accused of passing have denied that they did do so. Sterling can tell you more about Gene Tuma than I can, who is frequently cited as an example of the person who passed or did not pass whenever he felt like it. I can't contribute much to either question. Dr. Brown? I can't help on the first question about passing. Uh, I think passing has been, uh, I think that there's been a great deal of passing uh, in American life, uh, but I don't know about the statistics because one of the things about passing is, is, is hiding it. Uh, I think it's been too much written of in American fiction. I don't think it's an important thing. It's been set up, a stereotype of the uh, tragic mulatto when whites write it. Uh, the woman is fascinated by the, the white man, can't get him and commit suicide. <laughs> when our writers deal with it, woman passing until she goes by church and hears some good old soul music and decides she's going to be with her people. You get this nonsense about even Count Cullen would talk about, you know, being rejected, wanting to be with the whites and being rejected and wanting to be with the blacks and being rejected and got all this schizophrenia going around. I never knew anything of that. I certainly was never rejected by what I call the blacks, I never rejected, I never was rejected by any whites that I cared not to be rejected by, <laughs> seeking no acceptance particularly. We used to have a saying, you know, hold out your hand, be afraid to pull back a nub. You all wouldn't understand that. To talk about the racial cooperation, one old lady said, you know, they do the operating, <laughs> we do the copying. So, I, on the passing business, on Tumor's case, uh, Tumor came at a time when there was all this controversy about what we are called, right. Rose by any other name. For instance, uh, one of the best fighters for civil rights in Washington, was the wife of Judge Terrell, Mary Judge Terrell, and she was very angry with Dr. Rayford Logan because he would use the word Negro. I had a friend at Howard who was a friend of Bill Hastie, Gus Alzine. Gus Alzine was from Louisiana. Gus liked me a great deal. I gave him a copy of the Negro Caravan. But Gus put it on the floor, not in his bookcase. He liked me, he didn't mind having the book, but he wasn't going to have the word Negro Caravan up there. <laughs> now, he wouldn't have taken even colored caravan. So he had the word fighting for colored. Now, Gene Tumor's <coughs> grandfather was from New Orleans, <laughs> where you've got the whole business of separation, the South is cleavage, the word Negro, colored, and the rest, Creole. And he, it is said that he accepted being a Negro in order to get votes down there. But of course, by the standards in Washington, everybody knew he was a Negro. And they're talking about this, they'd look at him, you couldn't tell. Any one of us could tell. To make it short, and I can never make anything short, Gene Tumor had the problem of the Creole colored Negro. And so when James Weldon Johnson asked him for some poems for the Book of Negro Poetry. Gene was at the period when he was not say he said the word Negro is unimportant. Good Jeffrey taught him that the soul of the man was important and race was unimportant. So he says, I'm not going to do in the Book of Negro Poetry. And James Earl Johnson cracked on it. When Ulysses Lee 
And Arthur Davis and I got up in Negro Caravan. We wrote to Dean Tumble, and he allowed us to have three poems and two short stories. One of the best short stories we have is about Avery about Washington, D.C. And when the book press called uh, The Wayward and the Seeking, and he was a seeker all of his life, I understand him. Uh, he left his best stuff. He did his best stuff on the Negro in Washington and in the South, in Cain. After that, he fell off. But uh, he was up against certain things that he could not. He was, he was, he was seeking all of his life. Dr. Tom, do you like to comment? Well, as color business, I think, uh, worries the white man more than it worries us. I think uh, we've all heard about it from childhood on. Perhaps my scientific interests have made me think more of fundamentals the heart, the lungs, the vital systems. In no clinical condition are we concerned with the racial identity of a person. The wound such as Mr. Reagan had would not be affected at all by uh, any racial considerations whatsoever. For several years I've addressed all audiences after being introduced, uh, Mr. or Madam Chairman, fellow humans, because that includes everybody. I haven't got to the point where I say uh, person as a chairman, but uh, <laughs> that's a little further. Now, uh, geneticists have uh, indicated that uh, Perhaps uh, more than 37% of the American population have genes of what we would call Negroid source and don't know it. So what difference does it make? The only case in which I know, now I know that I have uh, African, European, and American Indian ancestors. But I have not been able to identify any of my positive traits or my negative traits with any of those genetic sources. Mrs. Cobb, my late wife, is the only one who's been able to do that because whenever the children were growing up and their behavior was not approved, she would say, just like your father. <laughs> I can't do any better than that and uh, presently in the future of the world if man survives he's not going to be any one particular type uh, if we are young as a species only three and a half million years old and it takes ten years for generally a mammalian species to reach maturity of course we may blow ourselves off the planet before that time but Look at all the intermixture that's going on. Presently, there will be, uh, that consideration will be a triviality. We have to take new approaches because it's one world now and it's shrinking. And uh, this thing called hate must be eliminated. Uh, it's a self-destructive force, as Melville pointed out in Moby Dick, which is a great international novel. Uh, Captain Ahab hated the whale because the whale had bit off its leg but the whale was an animal and he made the whale white and devotes a whole chapter to the whiteness of the whale showing it was terror now his four superstars the harpooners represented all the races of mankind uh, Queequeg the South Sea Island the Tashtigo the Narragansett Indian Dagu, the African, and Sadala, the Oriental. And they were all expert. And the whale ship got filled with oil and the officers wanted to go home. No. They have wouldn't relent. He caught up with Moby Dick and mauled him. But the whale rammed the ship, sank it, and got away. 
the message left is that hate is a self-destructive force. So if we don't do anything about it, we'll destroy ourselves as a species that it won't matter whether one is white or one is black or any of the intermixtures between them. I had another question over here. I'd like to know what the role of the policy of black press was. What I'd like to know if you could tell us why they did The question is, what was the role of the black press in Washington? And what is your perception of it now? Has it diminished? What is its, what is its current state? May, do you want I'll to speak to that. All right. Thank God for the black press. And I would say that it is uh, not uh, uh, fully appreciated today. Now, I can't say what uh, its future role. I'm like Rayford, I don't go in for predicting. But I know that if it had not been for the crisis, if it had not been for the Journal of the National Medical Association, uh, and media like that, that many of the things I, which I've written would not have been published. And if that medium is lost, that's a kind of castration. So God save the black press, I say. Okay. The Negro press has made <clears throat> a valuable contribution, both in terms of presenting information <clears throat> and of developing a sense of self-respect. There may be some Washingtonians here who remember the Washington Bee. Amen. Debbie Calvin Chase. <clears throat> Going way back to the early 1820s, we think of Freedom Journal and the rights of all, so that for more than 150 years, the Negro press has been a powerful instrument in asserting the aims and goals of civil rights and recording the achievements of many Negroes. I can only second that. I have known, I've been a subscriber and a reader of the Afro-American when it was Baltimore and then Baltimore and Washington. I knew Carl Murphy when he taught German at Howard and I knew the, the editors there and uh, the Pittsburgh Courier, Chicago Defender, uh, the uh, North Journal and Guide, I knew P.B. Young, I knew his sons who ran it. There was a paper here not so well known, but it was excellent because of one of its columnists, and that was a paper uh, that was run by West Hamilton, and I was right out of college, and I wrote an art, I wrote a column in there called Junius Junior. A Junius was an 18th century satirist, and I was a junior, and I lasted for about six issues. The paper lasted for about seven. Uh, it was first grade, it was called the Washington Tribune, but when Rayford mentioned, and Rayford Monty mentioned the crisis, Opportunity was a very important journal, and for that I wrote a column for many years. I was under, uh, John. well, I knew, I knew, uh, I knew it was Charlie well, well, but, uh, the editor I was with Elma Carter, much underestimated. Opportunity and the crisis, file on, then the uh, ebony, and what hurts me is, of course, one of the best things that Johnson Publication got out was, first, the Negro Digest and the Black World, <laughs> and they were killed, although they were the best vehicle for creative artists, the ebony thrives, but Johnson killed off. And the first world is, was on a shoestring, but I was down in Atlanta meeting to raise funds for it, and uh, there's a chance now that it will get on its feet. It was a very valuable magazine. But we do need, and then there are many later magazines, Black Collegian, the Black Enterprises, they get advertising the rest. But the important thing is that we do keep up 
organs that express what we think. We've got to, we've got to support our own magazines, our own papers, and I'm afraid that we do not do that. So I have worries about our journalistic. The crisis uh, has changed somewhat. Opportunity is dead. A file on the Journal of Negro History was one of the most important things in the education of the four of us. I mean, what you have is Woodson was a very far-seeing and important person. So the, the journalistic people from Rust Worm and Cornish on down, Du Bois, of course, was most important because of the editorials in the crisis. I respect the soul of black folk highly, but the Du Bois of those editorials was a tremendous force, an intellectual force. So we need a press, we need magazines. Howard University in general of Negro education was one of the finest things under Charles S. Thompson. They've been very important. We must not let them die. Sterling, I agree with you completely. Uh, we need the black press. We have needed it. And in the time of Carter Woodson, he did so much for that Negro history recognition that I cannot see that the young people now seem to feel that all the movement came with the 60s. I went to Howard one time and had a group under me speaking and uh, something came up about uh, race and that type of thing and I told them, yes, I greatly respected uh, what our black press had done, but you are not going to limit me and my contributions to the black press, are you? Well, they said, we see no reason to write anything beyond that. That was in the 60s. And I said to them then, nothing is going to restrict my thinking. I've got to think universally. I must do that. But that doesn't keep me from recognizing my own ethnic background and having great respect for it. Uh, I remember uh, very distinctly that, well, I shouldn't call names, but the man who was editor of uh, the Black Books, or the Black Books Bulletin, uh, he had a great argument with me. We were both uh, readers at uh, Southern University. And uh, he said, uh, but you're wasting your time. I said, I'm wasting my time by, just because I've been published by some of the trade publishers? You mean that's a waste of time? Oh, yes, he said. If you would devote your time to, as you started out, I said, Look, I started out writing poems about Venus, the goddess of love, believe it or not. So I said, I have done the whole thing, and now I'm very hopeful of respecting my roots and writing out from that. But I also do not want to be restricted in my subject matter. I can sit here and think now how petty this business of restriction of any type is. If we follow the scientific articles now, we know that we are getting warnings all the time that this world, this world can blow up. Other planets have blown. What's to keep this in time? And then why, since we are such an infinitesimal part of the whole, should we say, you're restricted here, you're restricted there? Grant me, please the power of thinking of the whole. And then I can really respect my roots and my background. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you will all agree with me that we've had an extraordinary experience this afternoon. I want to thank each one of our panelists for being with us today and sharing their experiences with us. I want to say uh, before we take uh, a break, there will be two additional panels this afternoon going into the educational question in more depth and also looking at the issue of, of theater. I do want to express, I know on behalf of all of us, our appreciation to Obi Hardison and the Folger Library for the opportunity to conduct this symposium uh, here today. For those of you who don't know, there is a, 
an even smaller connection uh, than, than you might think. Uh, we are literally in the shadow of the Capitol, and the Folger Library for many years has had a very close affiliation with Amherst College, which was the college of Dr. Cobb and my late father, and I think has always shown a tradition of, of reaching out and looking to opportunities to reach to the community and to participate in history, and this really is history. Thank you all, and we'll be back again at 2.30. Hey, what time is it now? Yes. Time, uh, one more minute. Just for one moment. Just one moment. Uh, just one moment. Uh, if you are, have reservations for the whole day, if you are staying, uh, we are taking a 15-minute break. Leave something on your seat to hold your seat, please, in case someone else comes in. We know that they're, they're there for you. Let me also say that... Um, Oh, good, good.